Hi, my name is Chris Brennan, and you're listening to episode 249 of the Astrology Podcast. In this episode, I'm going to be talking with Benjamin Dykes about Robert Zoller, who passed away a couple of months ago in January of 2020. Uh, hey, Ben, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, so today is um, it's March 27th, 2020, starting at 12.14 p.m., like I said, 249th episode of the show. And um, I'm getting over a bit of a cold or something right now, so my voice is a little scratchy today. So you'll have to excuse me, or listeners will have to excuse that. Um, but yeah, so this is going to be a two-part episode, uh, where in the first half of this episode, we're just going to talk a little bit about Robert Zoller, who both of us knew, or was an astrologer that both of us knew. And then in the second part of the episode, I actually have an old interview that I did with Zoller from a previous podcast that I'm going to play that's about an hour long. The sound quality is not very good, but it was a pretty good biographical interview with him that I wanted to play just in order to remember his life and work. But I thought it would be good to talk to you first just to open that up and sort of introduce that and discuss sort of an overview of his life and some important points. So, um, and you're a good person to talk to about this because you're at this point one of the leading medieval astrologers, and that was something that Zoller himself specialized in. And you did study uh, Zoller's course at one point, right? Yep, I took the diploma course. Okay, I actually took his certificate course and then his diploma course. Okay, and attended some of his uh, um, well-known Canadian in-person uh, intensives. They lasted about four or five days apiece. Okay, so you did get a, like a certificate in medieval astrology from from Robert Zoller, right? Okay, cool. All right, well, let's set the stage. So his name is Robert Zoller or Robert E. Zoller. Um, he was born January 25th, 1947 at 8.59 a.m. in Mount Vernon, New York. And then he passed away just a couple of months ago on January 24th um, after a three-decade-long battle with Parkinson's, and that was just one day before turning 73 years old. So um, Zoller was basically, to summarize, was essentially one of the early pioneers in going back and looking at traditional astrology. Essentially, right? I think that's a good way to frame very concisely, like who he was and what his significance was. Yeah, he had studied under uh, Zoltan Mason, who I believe was in New York, and there were a number of students. Uh, and Zoltan Mason had introduced a bunch of people to the astrology of. Jean Baptiste Morin or Morinus, and uh, but but Zoller struck out on his own, translating uh, new material, and became a real champion of traditional and especially medieval astrology. Yeah, still drawing he went on, to... still drawing on Morinus a lot, but um, he he developed his own you know developed his own approach, especially using Bonatti. Okay, and he went to college and had. Gotten some background and some training uh, in Latin, or he knew Latin, and that gave him the unique ability to go back and read some of these uh, medieval and Renaissance astrological texts that other astrologers of the time both either didn't have the skills to read, didn't have the the background in languages, or in some instances just didn't have the interest in going back and looking at. Yeah, I think it was a good dose of both, and and for a lot of people, it was just lack of interest, you know. Who cares, sure. right? So, <laughs> and yeah, yeah. I mean, there was definitely more of a feeling of like in innovation and like trying to find new things and incorporating new techniques in much of the 20th century. It seemed like, and so Zoller was unique then in that he sort of went against the grain and started looking backwards at what some of the oldest texts were that he was able to read and access, and starting to understand things like the history of astrology. Um, so. Eventually, this culminated with his first book, which was pretty early, which was in 1980, and that was his book on the Arabic parts. Yeah, it was a it was a sustained attempt to 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 reintroduce people to the tradition, mm -hmm. and um, one of the things he would say is he would say the old ways are the good ways, um, and he loved saying things like that, but. Um, it's it's an important point to make, I think, that that we regularly talk with hand on heart about you know our old tradition and how astrology is so ancient and goes way back. But 
especially then, most astrologers had no idea what had been happening in astrology prior to Alan Leo. Uh, they mm. assumed either that it was junk, which contradicts the idea that we have an ancient science, or they assumed it was maybe very similar stuff. So he played an important role in reacquainting us with the very tradition that we normally claim for ourselves and showing us what it really was. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so he published the book on the Arabic parts in 1980, and the original title was The Lost Key to Prediction, the Arabic Parts and Astrology. And I think they re later in like the republished versions flipped the title and called it the Arabic parts in astrology, a lost key to prediction, but it was basically the same thing. And yeah, that book, I have I have a couple copies right here of, of his books. So that's yeah. the that's the republished version. That's more like widely known with the I think Arabic so. parts in the title first. Um, so and that book was largely based on Banati, right? Yes, it was large. He it opens with some of his own Zoller's own. Speculations based on sacred geometry and Neoplatonism, but most of it is a translation of Bonatti's material on the lots, which in turn he had gotten from uh, the Latin edition of Abu Mishar. So it's Abu Mishar as filtered through Bonatti. Okay, got it. So, and Bonatti was a 13th century, roughly, astrologer. He's like right on the line. I'm never sure whether they say 13th or what, 14th? Yeah, 13th century. And uh, and the book also, um, speaking of reacquainting people with the astrology, it wasn't just a, you know, a so to speak, a dead translation. What he did with this book and others was he then had a bunch of charts in the back where he started interpreting using the old rules. So he was showing us that the old ways were also working. And we're not just an old relic, right? Because he, would which, which even even many scholars, even if they were, you know, producing critical editions and so on, no one was bothering to practice it. But he was sure. So he he wasn't just into traditional astrology for antiquated purposes, but he was actually a practitioner of astrology who was reading charts mm -hmm. and um, applying the techniques in practice. Which again meant he was probably one of the earliest people doing that in terms of Western astrologers going back and looking at some of these techniques. Particularly natal. We have to remember that um, there's a strange feature of traditional astrology that there are some national differences. That In England, uh, they were not, and I think still do not do much traditional natal astrology, but they were big on William Lilly. Uh, sure. So, he was pioneering traditional natal astrology in the U.S. at the same time that people like Olivia Barclay were reintroducing people to Lily and Horary in the U.K. Right, in the 1980s? Yeah, in the 1980s. Okay, um, that's a really good point. So, um, this eventually culminates. I'm not sure if there's any other like things we need to say about him before we move on to the next stage of his career when things started to gain more steam. I mean, I did want to mention. So he's not just a practitioner in terms of being focused on natal and in terms of developing predictive techniques, but he and, and an approach to practical astrology. But he also had kind of a. Um, uh, religious or philosophical interests in astrology, and there was like a strong undercurrent of that in his work to some extent as well, right? Yeah, he. Um, there were a couple of things. He had a bit of a ceremonial magic background that he sometimes talked about, but he was also very interested in some of the older philosophies like uh, Platonism and Neoplatonism and Aristotelianism, and I don't think he ever got into Stoicism, but I mean, he did write. An, he wrote an article about it, like for the NCGR Journal or something, once to whatever for whatever okay. that's worth. Okay, so yeah, he was he was very much interested in the philosophies as well. So one of the one of the contributions I think he made, one of the things that he insisted on, was that there's a lot more overlap with traditional astrology and other things like 
magic and traditional philosophy. There's a lot more overlap than we think. And one of the benefits, I think, of uh, or, or one of the benefits he conferred upon his students was getting them to explore those because it, I think it helps people have more internal consistency in their philosophy and outlook when their astrology, their philosophy, their spirituality all kind of all uh, harmonize with one another. Mm -hmm. So you were being – in teaching traditional astrology the way he did, he was also introducing you to many other areas of um, you know, the Western mystery tradition and philosophy that many people would not otherwise have gotten into or even known about. Right. Also because the revival of some of those ancient techniques brought up some like philosophical issues that then – practitioners had to wrestle with, and that was almost a necessity then of bringing back some of those ancient philosophies at the same time that they were intertwined with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. that's. I think it's especially true with the topic of um, prediction. Um, and I don't know if that's something we should want to get into now or um, let me. I'll just like hammer through the rest of his bi biography, and sure. then we'll do yeah. some of those other like miscellaneous discussion topics. I think now that I'm thinking about it more, that might make make more sense. Sure. So in the 1980s, some people have told me that he was kind of like the lone voice in the U.S. sort of promoting traditional natal astrology, and then he did hear, and I think he says in the interview that I'll play later that he did hear. That there was starting to be this traditional revival from that was being spurred by people like Olivia Barclay around horary in the UK, and he he found that to be really encouraging. Um, but it wasn't until 1992 when he met up with Robert Hand and Robert Zoller that they um, decided to form a translation project to go back and translate a bunch of ancient astrological texts into modern languages into English and actually start. Reviving the tradition in full, and that was the birth of Project Hindsight. So that was in uh, 1992 with with Robert Schmidt and Robert Hand, who were the two other principal founders of Project Hindsight, the three Robs or the three Robites, mm -hmm. like some people called them. Mm -hmm. We owe them a lot. Yeah, that was a historical, really important turning point in terms of traditional astrology and Zoller. I'm sure was brought into the project to some extent because he had been doing it longer than anybody in terms of studying the tradition and studying traditional astrology and also mm -hmm. producing some of those translations and working with the techniques. So certainly he'd been working with traditional astrology longer than Hand and Schmidt, of course, while he had more of the background in classics and mathematics and everything else, was newer to astrology at that point, circa 1992, than either Zoller or, or Hand would have been. So the three of them form that project in 1992, and they start publishing translations uh, at least by 1983. And with under the auspices of Project Hindsight, Zoller, uh, with some translation and some editorial help from Hand and Schmidt, published uh, several translations from Latin, uh, including parts of Guido Bonatti. Uh, he published a translation of Alkindi's philosophical work titled On Stellar Rays, and he also translated um, a translation of the Liber Hermetis, so at least three major texts that were appearing in English from Latin translations for the first time. Uh, so those yep, were first time, yep. Yeah, so those are notable translations. Uh, eventually, Zoller left Hindsight relatively early due to creative differences. I think after just a few years of being of being there and working with uh, Hand and Schmidt, and he then continued teaching and promoting medieval astrology. Uh, began offering a written course in medieval astrology that many astrologers took and that influenced a number of astrologers who then got certification from him. Um, including people like Benjamin Dykes, as well as Christopher Warnock, and I'm sure a number of other. I've met a ton of other people that have taken his course and gotten that certification. Can you think of any other prominent, notable astrologers that took it that you know of offhand? Um, there's there's a whole bunch. 
uh, too many to mention. Okay, no problem. Uh, so eventually later in his life, around the mid-2000s, he received some attention for his prediction about 9-11, about the September 11th attacks, because he was publishing a newsletter in the late 1990s where he was making predictions based on mundane astrology, and he ended up making some eerily specific statements about um, the events that eventually turned out to be the September 11th uh, terrorist attacks. And he was actually featured in a History Channel episode in 2005 as a result of that. So unfortunately, um, he developed Parkinson's uh, disease in the 1990s, and eventually this became very debilitating by the mid to late 2000s, which slowed his creative output. Um, and that was something he, he struggled with over the course of the past two decades until he passed away in January. Yeah, yeah. There was um, there was a story that I've heard. I don't. I hope I'm not just spreading a rumor. But there's a story that I've heard that in the '90s he was doing construction work, hmm. and on a construction site he got hit in the head by something. And that it was shortly after that that the Parkinson symptoms started to happen. That's how I remember. So it's unknown whether or not he developed Parkinson's the way it normally happens, or whether there was some kind of damage done by the by the injury. But it he it meant that he struggled and suffered for many years with something that is really hard to uh, understand um, what he went through. Yeah. And I think I, I think Demetra told me a different story about some other speculation of how he might have gotten it. Um, so I'm sure there was a lot of he always wondered, and I know that he did try many different treatments and went to many different like healers and stuff in search of of something that would help for a number of years. Yeah. Um, I did want to share. It might be worth sharing his chart. Um, I think that would be okay. So I'll show it. Here, just using the traditional rulers as he would have looked at it. Um, <clears throat> so he had Pisces rising with Jupiter as the ruler of the ascendant in Scorpio in the ninth whole sign house. I believe it was also in the ninth house by quadrant because it's on the ninth house side of the degree of the midheaven, right? Yeah, I can't remember how the quadrant houses go, but I, I think you may be right. Okay. Um, and then Venus up near the degree of the midheaven in the 10th whole sign house in Sagittarius, and a conjunction of Mars and the Sun and Mercury in the 12th house in Aquarius, opposed by Saturn at 5 degrees of Leo retrograde, uh, and also the Moon conjunct the Ascendant at 11 degrees of Pisces. So that's his birth chart. Um, I noticed it was weird that he passed away just one day before his birthday. Um, so he, he was uh, in a first house perfection year, but the new moon was at like four or five degrees of Aquarius uh, in January, which was right where his natal sun was. So it's kind of weird that there was a new moon right on his natal sun uh, that very day. Mm. All right. So in terms of other discussion topics just related to him and his life and some things that were notable about him you had written down like a few things in terms of things that you learned or, or ways that he influenced things yeah I, I I was thinking of several things that um, specific things and and general topics where studying traditional astrology under under him changed my life or changed my astrology and the first thing had to do yeah, we with, should say pra practically yeah. speaking that you he did part he translated parts of Banati, but then part of your connection with them is you came in later and you you were the first one who translated the entirety of Banati, like maybe maybe yeah. 10, 10 years, 12 years later. Yeah, I published in 2007. So when did he do his first his uh his portions of it? It was under hindsight. Um, yeah, I mean it was like 1994 was Guida Bonatti, um, okay. parts one and part two, I believe. Okay, so about thirteen years. Yeah, so like a Jupiter, 
almost just after over a Jupiter cycle later. So, and you, you know, I remember seeing you guys at like a Project Hindsight conclave, and you saw him, and I think gave him a copy, copy or something like that. So there was some touchingness about that, where there was a real handing over of the tradition, where something that he had initiated and started, you were able to to bring to completion. So he was able to start to see some of that happen in his lifetime. And I was glad to give that to him because it had meant so much to me. Sure. Yeah. All right. So just go ahead. Sorry to interrupt. Well, the um, one of the things that originally attracted me to the traditional astrologers, um, uh, one of them was the idea of learning the new techniques or the old techniques. So you might think this is all about, uh, you know, technique oriented concerns. Mm. But actually, there were a number of ways in which Zoller's approach changed some of my, well, you could say there's emotional and spiritual effects um, and psychological effects to what he was doing. So the first thing is, um, he would sometimes joke that what he was doing was a therapy for recovering modern astrologers. And um, Right, because he was really like adamant. He he became a mm -hmm. what's the right way to put it? Like an extremist, like a traditional extremist in some level, almost to put it jokingly, Pure, but not purist? really. Purist. purist, yeah, purist. Strident, so he, you could strident could be a way sure. of putting it. <laughs> Definitely. So his and his statement, like you quoted earlier, the old ways or the good ways, is not just a funny little thing. It's like that's what he actually believed. Or not just the good way, ways, but the, was, the best ways. Yeah, the um, in a way he was like the old Stoics who loved coming up with really dramatic statements like that, that could either excite you or turn you off. But if you look at them in the right way, they're they do something very important. So uh, one of the things was uh, one of the practical things you have to do right away on in your astrology program is you have to turn off all the outer planets and the asteroids. And to many modern people, this is a great shock. But one thing that this does is it forces you to realize how your mind actually works. Because most people don't even notice that when they look at a chart, their eyes look at Pluto first, for example. They're not even aware of how their mind is actually working. And what he was doing was removing from the chart the things that many people are addicted to without even knowing it, and forcing you to re examine and reacquaint yourself with the other seven planets. You know, poor old Saturn has nothing to do when Pluto's in the room. So, we started becoming aware of what is it that we are looking at. Also, in the chart, what kinds of things are we looking for? Many people, and this is maybe natural in some ways, but there is something ghoulish about how many people look at an astrology chart. If their eyes are looking, if their eyes look directly and immediately at, let's say, Pluto and Uranus. And they're looking for trouble and problems. Like they're looking for psychological complexes. They're trying to dig up dirt in your, you know, from the depths of your mind. It makes you ask yourself, what am I really doing astrology for uh, when I don't when I can't rely on some of these things as crutches? Also what? At the same time, that being said, though, you said one of his first like tasks that you have to do as a student is calculate your length of life, right? Well, that's later. That was in a later later lesson. Okay. This was this was an initial shock, kind of an initial shock treatment. It okay. wasn't as much of a shock to me, uh, but um, so you take these things out, but it also forces you to ask. If I don't have, let's say, these outer planets or asteroids, and and um, if I'm taking things out of the chart and making it look cleaner and simpler, I'm starting to ask myself, what kinds of explanations do I have for what's happening in the chart? We so we start to realize and re-examine 
what are the tools that we have been relying on and how can we strengthen them and enrich them with traditional concepts and also, um, in a sense, cleanse ourselves of some addictions that we might have as astrologers. So, more having more points in the chart does not mean more wisdom, could be another way to put it. Mm. So, he's forcing you to rely on wisdom and deeper concepts instead of larding up the chart with points. So, that was one of the very first things that happened, and it was a really good a really good education and way of re-examining how I thought about astrology. How did that how was that balanced though with him also being the pioneer in reintroducing the Arabic parts, which became certainly in the later portions of the medieval traditions like the height of excess or could become the height of excess of like excessive use of sensitive points that, that become unnecessary if used, you know, unsparingly? Yeah, the um, you there were traditional astrologers. I think it was Al Biruni who complained that there were so many of them, um, right. and definitely, definitely when I first started doing horary, this is before I started doing traditional. So I was a teenager, and it was the early eighties, and um, I was doing horary astrology, and I was learning about these things called Arabic parts. And when I would do horary charts, and I couldn't understand what the chart was saying because I didn't understand the technique, the, the basic techniques, mm -hmm. I would start inventing lots of my own to hopefully just get me the answer quick. Right. And um, I think Zoller's training was good because um, he trained you in thinking that less can be more if you have the right tools. So just uh, inventing new lots will not give you the answer if you don't know what lots are in the first place. And mm -hmm. if you do know what they are, then you can be sparing in, a, a, and careful in how you use them. So a lot of, the, lot of what he was teaching was uh, care about what you're doing, um, and in that case, less can be more. Sure, that makes sense. Um, so he was bringing back simple things but powerful things like house rulership and, and knowing how to interpret like the ruler mm -hmm. of one house mm -hmm. in another house and things that had were core staples mm -hmm. of ancient and traditional mm -hmm. astrology but had somehow like fallen out of the modern astrological approach to natal astrology yeah it's it's such simple stuff and when it's explained to you you realize well of course of course that must be important but it's surprising that you can look, you can have two people look at a chart, and the traditionalist, the eyes immediately go to where the lord of a house is, for example. But a different kind of approach, and a more modern approach, might go to something totally different. So um, it was back to basics, but also uh, realizing what the real foundations of, of uh, chart reading are. Sure. I know um, annual perfections and monthly perfections were another big technique that he championed that he was bringing back into usage from traditional astrology. Mm -hmm. were yeah, there that other was a th real eye like opener that? for me. Yeah. I'd mm -hmm. never heard of such a thing. I just thought there were progressions and transits. And here were these strange things called perfections. And, uh, I would say uh, there have been a couple of times when perfections and the idea of Time Lords has almost saved my life. Sure. In terms of facing problems in life mm -hmm. and realizing that, uh, that traditionally various planets take up management roles in your life, but when they're done, they're done and time moves on. So it was a, that was very important to learn. There was one little special perfection thing that he did that I, I learned from him where he would calculate the like perfected lord of the year and then he would do the monthly perfections to see when the monthly perfections would come to the sign that contained the lord of the year or something like that. And 
Mm -hmm. It was a technique that I always like looked for, and I never found it in any traditional text. And I asked him once, and he said that he learned it from like an Indian astrologer at one point, mm -hmm. which I thought was kind of interesting mm -hmm. in terms of his openness to looking at other traditions or other mm -hmm. ancient approaches and, and sort of taking something of value if it was still consistent essentially with traditional astrology. He also, I remember, um, was the first person I'd ever heard of to teach about triplicity lords mm. and the idea that they were not only interpretive but dealt with periods of your life. And I remember I was in grad school and taking the course, and it was summer, I think. Campus was all emptied out. It was just me and other grad students basically on campus. And I walked around for hours. I could not wrap my mind around triplicity lords. Mm. And it, yeah, it took hours and hours of walking and walking and walking and finally understanding them and realizing that my way of looking at the world had changed. So there was a lot of uh, recalibrating your mind that happened uh, because of his teaching. Sure. Uh, what were the other things? You had like two or three other points of things like that? Well, one is um, one was uh, something you mentioned that was uh, one of the early lessons in prediction was it was on longevity and using the techniques to understand the standard life expectancy of of a native and how to predict possible ends of life. <laughs> and the homework for the lesson was <laughs> take your chart and predict the date of your own death. <laughs> and uh, again, it was kind of a shock, but it was really instructive because I realized oh, this is really serious stuff. Mm -hmm. Just as the old astrologers who worked for kings and generals, their lives were on the were on the line if they got things wrong. And I thought about how easily I and other people just show their charts to everybody. We show our, hey, look at my chart. And that's when I really realized, oh, wait a minute. If someone can see something like my likely date of death. Do I really want to be that open and 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 promiscuous about um, showing everyone my chart, and and what kind of what kind of flattery or vanity is involved in me doing that? So that was um that was a really serious moment when I had to then get out my chart and count and apply the techniques and face my own death. Mm, interesting, uh, and I I feel like some of that. Thing about um, not sharing your chart also seemed like it came partially from the magical tradition, and that was something that he also had some interest or some background in. I know Christopher mm -hmm. Warnock, when I interviewed him a few months ago, said that Zoller was actually the one who first introduced him to the Picatrix, which then mm -hmm. ended up being very influential in terms of Christopher Warnock's later work to promote that and eventually have it translated and um, be one of the sort of primary people. Promoting the practice of astrological magic and its revival again in re recent times, especially the past few years or past decade. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he had influence on so many of us uh, in so many ways. Sure. So, so that that was, I mean, that was a specific example of a you know of, of a technique that really had um, a big effect on me. I think another example would be. Uh, well, we were we were talking about one of his other bombastic statements about astrology and objective truth, but in terms right. of prediction, th this is kind of a this is kind of a well, it's a practical and kind of a moral a moral thing. Uh, many people think that in traditional astrology, with with you know so much prediction going on. That traditional astrologers um, are really big on control. Like we think we can control everything, or we want to control everything through prediction. Um, but it's actually the opposite. What you're actually learning from this perspective is what are the things that uh, you can control and don't control, and how can you assess your strengths and weaknesses 
and know when those will be, uh, uh, let's say it's a strength, when will be a good time in life to take advantage of that strength to manage your life well. A lot of the predictive stuff is about uh, wise life management and waiting for the right moment. Whereas there's lots of things when you're predicting, you realize that you're not in control and that part of the moral, uh, the moral thrust of this is coming to, uh, uh, coming to peace with your role in the universe, that you can't control everything. You can only manage things, and here are tools to do it. So coming to have some peace with your role in the universe and prediction helps show that to you. Mm, okay. And along those lines, I mean, that does bring us to that statement that you mentioned in terms of um, he did sometimes go far. I remember, so my, my connection with him is when I was living at Project Hindsight for two years, from 2005 to 2007, he moved back there and he reconnected with Schmidt briefly and lived at in the same house basically for a year when I was still there. So I lived in the same house as him for a year. One of the statements that he made at one point, um, because I think he had actually given like a paper at a conference in Amsterdam in 2004 where there was a conference of academics, and he caused a stir because he got up and he presented a paper basically saying that astrology was the only objective measure of reality or something like that. And that not only was the astrology always right, but it's the only true way of knowing what's going on in the world. I think it was his basic yeah. thesis of that paper. Yeah. And it was something that he repeated. And I remember him saying then. And I've had a really interesting, complicated relationship with that because at the time I remember thinking how over the top and like extremist and almost arrogant that that sounded, uh, which to some extent is still true. And I think it was still weird for him to present that paper in that way, perhaps at an academic conference of other historians of the history of astrology. But on the other hand, I've seen some ways in which that is true, where sometimes the astrology does give you insight into reality despite you sometimes not knowing that it's right and sometimes even you thinking that it's wrong or thinking otherwise and later only coming to realize that what the astrology was saying all along was correct. And I've gotten a, a better sense of why he started approaching things from that perspective in some ways in which that might have actually been true. Yeah, I think you're right to say it's an approach and a perspective because even if it's not simply true that astrology is the only what is it the it's the only objective measure of reality. I think that's how I remember it. Okay, but he he would say that that may not strictly be true. But it might be good if you at least acted that way and focused on the idea of objective reality. So don't look at the chart and look at Neptune and then ask yourself, well, how do I feel about Neptune? Pretend Neptune is an objective neutral observer and, and focus on what Neptune itself is doing. Because we are all, in various ways, in our own mental prisons. And the lesson of this is that you are more deluded than you think, and you are more wrong than you think, and you are more filled with wishful thinking than you think. Mm. So if you, if you say that astrology is the only objective measure of reality, it forces you to to question your own mental prisons and delusions uh, so that if if Mars is doing something awful in the chart, stop whitewashing it. Come to grips with it and learn how to manage it. Yeah, well, and sometimes Instead of his, ret retreating to your mental prison. Sometimes then I remember that his delineation style could be very straightforward then and very stark perhaps. Uh, too stark in in the statements that he would make to clients about what he thought what his interpretation was of their chart and what that meant about their life. Yeah, yeah. Um, his bedside manner 
<laughs> maybe left something to uh, to be desired. But sometimes I think he might say sometimes you need the shock treatment. Sure. And and I've had experiences where the chart is telling, and he he would talk about this. Here's here's an example to go along with this that um, you said it sounded outrageous, and then later on you kind of came around to seeing his kind of seeing it from his way. Mm -hmm. He would tell he would talk about how he would do public chart readings, and so when he would teach something. Uh, he said, "You have to have confidence in your in the astrology that when you see a chart and you're in front of a group of people, you can say what it means and you don't feel worried about it, mm -hmm. which is can be scary. A lot of people would never do that, mm -hmm. which could could show you that they don't quite trust their astrology. Sure. But he would say that some he would say sometimes I'm in front of a group." And I and people ask me to look at their chart and there and you can tell they want a certain kind of answer, but the chart says different. He said, so I tell them what the chart says, and they will tell me that I'm lying. And he would say, the astrology is never wrong. They are the ones who are lying. And I thought, wow, how arrogant can you get? You're telling me that someone is just going to lie to you about their own chart. Be so it just seemed so outrageous until it happened to me. Mm -hmm. And I've had times when I have, including in groups of people, um, read a chart and people knew how I was going to read the chart and I wasn't going to whitewash it. And the person would say, no, that's not true. Or that never happened. What are you talking about? Mm -hmm. And then I would think, wow, maybe, maybe I'm totally out of it you know i'm totally and then i would find out later that no the chart was right and that maybe they were embarrassed or or i've i've seen cases where people have been deluding themselves about what the chart means and we find out later that the chart was absolutely right so what seemed outrageous at first i then came around to seeing things more from his perspective yeah, I had a ex I've had instances like that as well and um instances like that including reading a live chart example where several astrologers did of the same person and all were seeing the same thing from different perspectives but the person didn't really confirm it and then later we learned afterwards privately that something major had happened in that person's that part of the person's life. Um yeah. so I definitely see that and I understood better. There's still Maybe some sort of moderation or balance between, you know, uh, just assuming that you're always right or assuming that the person is lying or whatever, and not getting too uh, overly confident about one's abilities versus the mm -hmm. importance of developing some level of skill and confidence. Um, and I'm not sure what that middle ground is, but I, I at least understand the point better now. Yeah, I think, I think, uh, I, my impression is he we needed a real correction to our approach so if it's like a if it's like libra if it's like a balance we've been like this for too long sure. and he really needed to slam down hard to get things more in balance that makes total sense and, and that, uh, that's a great summary yeah. of just about everything he did with traditional astrology actually because he took everything to yeah. that extreme but it was because he was like the only guy doing it for so long, and it was such the opposite mm -hmm. extreme for so long that he was trying to balance it out. And maybe being able to contextualize his work like that would make more sense. Yeah, either no one else was doing it, or or no one else was interested in doing it, and so he had to be he had to be the guy to do it. And uh, I think he did it well. It changed a lot of lives and improved astrology for it. Yeah, definitely. And now. The traditional astrology has become a mainstream thing, um, thanks in no small part to what he did. So that makes sense. Um, yeah. Well, thanks for joining me today for this. I'm trying to think of any other anecdotes. There's probably a few, um, but I think that's probably good and a good place to leave this discussion. So uh, thanks for joining me today. Well, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it, and and thanks for letting me uh, pay back a little more to my teacher. Yeah, thank you. 
All right. Well, I'm going to play and transition at this point into playing this interview from Robert Zoller from 2010 from Traditional Astrology Radio. Sorry, the audio quality isn't great, but um, hopefully it'll give you some insi more insight into Robert Zoller and his life and his work. Welcome to WTAR Traditional Astrology Radio. My name is Chris Brennan, and today is Sunday, January 9th, 2011. Tonight, I will be interviewing world-renowned medieval astrologer Robert Zoller. Zoller is widely recognized as one of the leading astrologers to advocate uh, a return to traditional astrological techniques and methods, uh, especially starting in the early 1980s with his book, The Arabic Parts in Astrology, A Lost Key to Prediction. So through his work, he's played a major role in spurring the revival of traditional astrology around the world, uh, pretty, pretty much everywhere from what I've, what I've seen. He also has the distinction of being one of the few astrologers who issued predictions about 9-11 prior to the attacks. So before we get started, I should state that uh, more information about Zoller's work can be found on his website, www.virginastrology.com. So Robert, welcome to the show. Thank you, Chris. It's great to be here. Yeah, thanks for joining me. So I wanted to start off with just some biographical information about who you are and where you've come from and what you've done. So first things first, how did you get into astrology? Well, I was pretty sick as a kid. I had asthma, and I couldn't participate in sports as much as I would have liked. So I ended up staying at home and reading just about everything I could get my hands on. So by the time I was finished with sixth grade, I'd read all the Celtic myths, all the Germanic myths, all the Greek myths and legends. And uh, in the course of doing that, I came across something called folklore. And folklore was primarily the Grimm's brothers, or one of the Grimm's brothers. I forget which one now. But anyway, I read all, all that stuff. And in there, I learned about magicians and unicorns and things of that sort. But the magicians and the uh, astrologers and the alchemists really intrigued me. So it wasn't until I was in the 10th grade, about 16 years of age, that I was able to get my first book on astrology, and that was uh, Edward Lindo's book, uh, Astrology for Everyone, I think was the title of it. But I couldn't do much with it at the time because I had to prepare to go to college. So I put it on the back, on the shelf, back burner, so to speak. And I didn't look at it again until I was out of college. The uh, first college I went to was in the 60s. And as you can imagine, 1965 to 68, there wasn't a lot of college going on in the colleges, especially in New York. So I had a lot more time than I thought I would. And I got into uh, reading as much as I could about astrology at that point. And one thing led to another, and I got a teacher. And uh, eventually disagreed with my teacher, but he was right. instrumental in setting me on the right strength, right, the right uh, track. And this is um, the uh, infamous Zoltan Mason who uh, introduced you to traditional astrology. And that was Mr. Zoltan Mason, who was, was my teacher, my first teacher in astrology, who uh, told me that if I wanted to get into the real astrology, I had to get into languages. And into the classical languages in particular. You rattled me off a number of classical languages. Greek, Latin, Sanskrit, Hebrew, Arabic. Went on and on and on. Then he said, now get out of here. Get out of my office. He was a little bit brusque. He had a, a tough time of it himself. Yeah. Came to the United States after the Second World War. And it wasn't easy to get to the United States from Hungary, which is, I think, where he was at the time. So, uh, we eventually did get to, uh, get into the United States, became a citizen, and lived here, uh, until about 1998, something like that, when he passed away. So it, it was at this point that you started studying ancient languages and started studying older traditional authors? Yeah, I realized that uh, he had a wonderful bookstore 
Mr. Mason did. On 61st Street, uh, between 61st and 62nd, I think it was. But it was on Lexington Avenue. And it was the second floor up. They so used to walk up the creaking stairs. Nobody would have ever been able to sneak up on him coming up those stairs because the stairs creaked very loudly. And, uh, then you'd walk through this door that had a bell on it. And he would come out from the back room and he would say something like, what are you looking for? In this almost threatening sort of manner. And people would say, I want to browse. And, no browsing. You must know what you're looking for. But if you got past his rough introduction, he was a real sweetheart and he was real helpful. If he thought you were serious. So I convinced him that I was serious. And he was very helpful to me with the books that he had. And at that time, there weren't many books published on astrology. Astrology still hadn't made it into the, into the publishing world. Although people were buying a lot of books. They, whatever was available would be bought. But the publishers themselves were very cautious with the, what books they would put out. Now, that meant that we had a lot of secondhand books floating around, some of which were really outstanding books, very valuable. One of these books was uh, Jean-Baptiste Morin de Villefranche. Jean-Baptiste Morin de Villefranche, Astrologia Gallica. And uh, that became the core of his teaching of astrology. And about the time that I complained to him that he was just teaching pop astrology, where could I get the real stuff? And that's when he told me about the languages. And it was the languages that I went in the direction, learning languages, in particular learning Latin, I did at the Summer Latin Institute in New York on 42nd Street in Manhattan. And uh, I did 11, I did two and a half years of Latin in 11 weeks. Now, one of the women who had done this course prior, I think it was a year prior to when I was there, which was only four, she was uh, so impressed, and it was such an intensive course, that she suffered thereafter from being pursued in her dreams by passive periphrastic. Imagine that. <laughs> so, I learned Latin so that I could get into the original sources. And I, then I continued my Latin from 1975 to 77 at the Institute for Medieval Renaissance Studies at City College under Madeline Cosman. And I had the very good fortune up there to meet Dr. Cosman, find that she was amenable to the kind of research that I was interested in. She helped me a great deal. And uh, she put me in contact with him, I became a student, briefly, of um, Richard LeMay, who was the world's authority on Abu Mashar. Very fortunate, because that's which I wanted to go in. I, while well, I was studying with Zoltan, which was between 1970 and 1974, I realized that, that there was a real astrology out there in the work of one Guido Bonatti. So I was I was aware that there was a very serious brand of astrology and there was pop astrology. And the pop astrology has continued, of course, to the present day. It is in the process of trying to fool us by assimilating itself with real astrology, but it won't be able to fool us for long because it just doesn't work. Whereas the stuff that Guido Bonatti and Jean-Baptiste Miranda de did certainly does work. I mean, that's extraordinary that you ran into Richard LeMay, who's the world expert on the leading medieval astrologer, ninth century medieval astrologer, uh, Abu Mashar, and who I think compiled the standard critical edition of his greatest work. But you yeah. had the fortune of running into him, and then that led to, around this time, becoming familiar with Benati, and that, that became the basis of your first book, correct? I did. I was approached by uh, Clark Stillman, who was at that time working for Wiseman 
in New York, which was a bookstore that catered to a cult and oriental interest. And uh, Clark asked me to write a book on the Arabic parts. Nobody had written such a book at that point. Since Llewellyn George wrote a large section of his A to Z astrology delineator, which was a book that I had at one point. I don't really think so much of it now, but it was a really it was an encyclopedic attempt to produce it was a great attempt to produce an encyclopedia of astrology. Perhaps that's the way I should say it. And he, it turns out that that book was influential in, especially in the West Coast, where I'm not mistaken, well, he enjoyed his club. But, um, the, uh, was Gallica, which was, uh, more interesting. It's French astrology is the title of the translation, the title of that. Gallic astrology. It was a tremendous influence on me initially. I think I've gotten beyond it now with my interest in, uh, Guido Bonazzi is the proper pronunciation of his name. I'm always being criticized for slurring these names and these vowels together. So they I should properly be spoken with an Italian accent. Guido Bonazzi. And this is the same Guido Bonazzi, who, by the way, Dante placed in the eighth circle of hell in his Commedia Divina, where he says, Vedi Guido Bonatti. I saw Guido Bonatti in the eighth circle with his head turned around backwards forever throughout all eternity for having had the audacity to try to prove the future and predict the future. But uh, he puts Bonatti in very good company in the eighth circle of hell, which is where he's actually lodged him in that poem. And he has been in the company of one very famous Arabic astrologer and alchemist named, uh, this is uh, Ibn Hayyan. Uh, Javier Ibn Hayyan is the man's name, who is to astrology, or is to alchemy, what uh, Ptolemy is to astrology, namely the, uh, the distance Acme, the far pinnacle of uh, knowledge on these subjects. So at this point in the early 80s, you release your book on the Arabic parts, drawing largely on Guido Bonatti, and then basically your career in astrology, I assume, starts taking off. But what what is it like being one of the only guys, if not the only guy, who's into traditional astrology at this point in the astrological community? Well, that was exactly the condition, the situation. I was, uh, initially, I couldn't give it away. I, uh, went around to the various astrological clubs and, uh, organizations and asked for time to speak on this subject. And I got a little bit of time from the Iranian Society at the very beginning. But most of these organizations were a little bit at a loss, as you can imagine. They never heard of this stuff. They didn't know anything about their own history. And, uh, it's sort of analogous to uh, the response that I got in Canada from a teacher of Arabic. And I said to this teacher of Arabic, uh, when she asked me why I was studying Arabic, I said, uh, that I am a writer. And I believe I said that to her in Arabic. I said, I, I think is the proper pronunciation for that. And it's a lovely language, Arabic. It reminds me of Hebrew in some ways, and in other ways it reminds me of heaven. It's very rational, I think. And it has these triliteral roots. So you can make up verbs out of the roots, and the same verb can be turned into a noun, and an adjective, and things like that. So that's appealing to me. Not like English. But at any rate, uh, I said to her, I'm a writer on astrology. The second question out of the mouth was, of course, you're a writer, but what do you write about? So I had to tell her astrology. And she said, oh, I wasn't aware that the Arabs knew anything about astrology. And that was, of course, the standard academic 
paranoia about astrology. The fact is, the Arabs knew more about astrology. They'd forgotten more about astrology, perhaps, than we may ever really know. That, uh, that was their, one of their big contributions to, to civilization is their mathematics, their poetry, and, uh, their, their knowledge of science and mathematics. Right, they became the sort of sole possessors of the astrological tradition for several centuries during the Middle Ages. Right. Now, the, uh, the astrological community was pretty much in the same bag, or same condition, as the, uh, the academics prior to, let's say, around 1980. Now, in 1980, I was going public with the fact that I knew about this stuff. And I was surprised to find there was nobody studying it, besides me, in the United States. So I, I started looking around, writing to all and sundry, corresponding with Alec Howe and uh, R.A. Gilbert and uh, a number of people in Europe, and some German contacts, some French contacts, and English contacts, and... Uh, Little by little, I began hearing stories about Olivia Barclay, who was uh, working very hard, trying to get, going through some of the similar kinds of experiences I was having, to be getting recognition of the subject matter on the part of the astrological community. And she was doing, she was running the same sort of problem in England. But they did get it off the ground in England. And, of course, they have pursued it ever since, the way the English pursue many things, namely on the QT. Uh, one of the differences between America and England is that we got big mouths. We talk about everything, and they don't. The, the mere fact that it looks as though nobody's doing something doesn't mean that nothing's happening in England. It just means that it's all behind the scenes. And I don't think that I would be talking out of school to say that. I don't think they would disagree with me if they heard me say that. So, I said it and I'm glad. Right. So you, right right at the same time that you're sort of trying to initiate this revival of medieval astrology, you have friends or at least other people over in England doing the same, focusing their work on William Lilly in the 17th century tradition. and then. By the 90s, I assume you're starting to gain steam and you, you, you become the founding, one of the founding members of Project Hindsight and Arhat, uh, with Robert Hand and Robert Schmidt. Yeah, it's about right. It's about the right timetable too. Things really fell together, as so far as I can remember and so far as I saw them at the time. Things really fell together. Around 1992, I think it was, when we went to a new American Astrology Congress in Crystal City, Washington, D.C. And the Crystal City was uh, either the name of the neighborhood or it was the name of the hotel. I don't quite remember what the situation was there, but it was a very nice place that we stayed in. And... Uh, Olivia was there, and I was there, and Schmidt was there, and White, and White, Ellen Black was there, and Rob Hand was there. And uh, Schmidt and I were sort of auto-intoxicated at that point on our own dreams about a mathematics universalis, a universal mathematics that would answer all questions. And his contribution to that was uh, the... Uh, recitation of what he had learned at St. John's and whatever he had figured out on his own subsequent to that time. He went to college at St. John's University in Maryland, in Annapolis, I think it was. So he had many things to say about the Collette and uh, Mathis' universal and algebra's relationship to algebra. And I found that very intriguing at the time, and we were so we were sort of intoxicated and dream up at universal mathematics. But 
the state would have it, but we weren't given the opportunity to do, to do that. Instead, I think the, uh, how shall I put this? The demon of artificial intelligence insinuated itself into the conversation in such a way that uh, we couldn't continue the dialogue. Now, Rob Hand was there at the time. I don't think he was ever tremendously impressed with this concept of uh, Mathesis and Versailles. He was very interested in astrology at that point. Now, he had just returned from uh, Spain, where he had met somebody who was studying the works of Philip II, astrologer. And he used, this astrology used something that nobody, that me and perhaps Olivia, and Olivia's students, including Maggie Meister and Lee Lehman, these people all had heard about Al Newton of Housie. And as you know, that is a, essentially the plant that has the most dignity in a given house. So, this is a tremendous asset in judging what that house is going to produce and how it's going to produce it and all the rest of that. And the houses are, of course, indices of, or fields, if you, if you like, uh, wherein the means of uh, certain concepts are emphasized. So by studying the rulers of those houses, you can elicit a very clear picture of what the chart is going to offer, what the chart is promising. Now, Rob was, had had his, his head filled to the brim while in Spain by somebody who was studying this uh, Spanish astrologer's work. And uh, he was very enthusiastic about astrology at that point, about medieval astrology. He notified everybody at the time, and I was in the room who said this, that Zola's dominance of uh, medieval astrology cannot go unchallenged. <laughs> so, he's been challenging it ever since. And I think that's good. I think that competition and that sort of stuff pushes us all to further excellence. Right. And then, so the three of you then get together. Uh, the three Roberts, and you start translating texts. You start producing a translation of Guido Bonatti, translations of the um, Latin works ascribed to Hermes, and that takes off. Uh, eventually, you leave, uh, but then by this point, you are still, and I think even still today, established as the leading authority on medieval astrology in the world. And then by the time the late 90s roll around, it seems like you've got a pretty strong following and you're you're issuing your, was it a monthly newsletter? Yeah, I, I picked up the word somewhere along the line. I think I was in, I was in the, North, in the Midwest. It must have been Michigan or, or Minneapolis is. Uh, sure, in New York, I'm terribly... I don't want to say bias, but that might be the word I'm stuck with here. I just can't imagine anything west of the Hudson River as being anything other than the Midwest. Yes, of course, but that's the way I look at it. Subconsciously, that's the way I've been brought up to look at it. But at any rate, we were out in the Midwest somewhere, and we were getting a very good response. Rob was there, Schmidt was there, I was there. I think still at the same place. And, uh, Somebody who works for Matrix was returning some papers to Schmidt that they that he had left there at Matrix, and it included a periodical. And Schmidt referred to it as a periodical, and uh, the guy corrected him and called it a sporadical. So that my my newsletter was a uh, Hermuntius messenger and somebody announced or something. And uh, I had in mind angels for that. But uh, it was really, although it was intended to be every two months, I think initially, 
it really was went through a period when it was one per month and it went to another period where it was sporadical in fact and I guess that's really where it's still at because when the Parkinson's began to trouble me in the 90s I couldn't any longer maintain an absolute regularity with my writing so it's really a sporadical but it was in that newsletter uh, Nuntius that you started issuing predictions or you, you would regularly issue predictions and I think one of the things that you become the most well known for outside of the astrological community is making some pretty specific statements uh, about what turned out to be the attacks on September 11th, uh, 2001. So what was the, like, can you talk a little bit about those predictions and what the, the aftermath of that was? Yeah. Those predictions were made in a series of responses to people's questions. The first one was made at a dinner that I was invited to in London at the David Broad's house. You know, maybe I you can't remember the name of the street right now. But um, also in attendance at that dinner was Liz Green. So this was an attempt to put Liz Green and I in the same room. And I suppose it would have been a little bit humorous for somebody to watch if she wasn't such a, a consummate and highly sophisticated person when it comes to interpersonal relationships, especially with strangers from your own country. So the, the sort of astrology that she practiced and the sort of astrology that I practice are really millennia apart at space and time. I don't see any reason why I can't talk about millennia in terms of the difference between what she's doing and what I'm doing. But she's an expert at what she does. Well, at any rate, that was the first context. That was where the remarks were made about the House of Bush. And uh, I said that there'll be a new president in the United States at the next election, and that there will be a, a new president will be at the House of Bush, but he won't have as much experience in running things as the first Bush did. And I made a couple of other remarks there. And that was the end of that. Now, subsequently, but actually before that, I had made the statement in Nuncius that uh, it looked as though there was going to be major economic difficulties for the United States, and that historically the best way for us to deal with that sort of thing, or at least the way the the, the economic pundits in the United States generally tend to do things, is that they wage a war as a way of getting you out of the slump. So I figured there was a war coming. And then uh, I got back home after the dinner in London and uh, looked at everything again, confirmed my concerns, and uh, started paying attention to Milosevic, who was one of the people who I mentioned in the Nuncius newsletter. Now, at the time, he was a free man. So it wasn't long after that that they jailed him. And I guess he's uh, still in jail. And I don't know what happened to him, frankly, at this point. But he was mentioned in that one of those Nuncius newsletters, as was Osama bin Laden. So the final two of my newsletters that pertain to the subject uh, called out the uh, danger of Islamic fundamentalism to American values and the American way of life. Named Osama bin Laden, named the month in which the danger was likely to happen, and the area of the country where the attack was likely to come from. So I think I did it. Passable good job on that aspect of things. Right. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think anyone else um, was able to issue statements uh, that were that accurate. I think you said 
uh, The Greatest Period of Dangers in September 2001. Uh, it'll be on the eastern seaboard of the United States. Something about inviting the depredations of adventurers such as Osama bin Laden. So you you made those statements, and I think one of the things that not a lot of people know about is you actually did try to, or you, you told me once that you tried to contact the authorities or con- contact the FBI in order to alert them to this, correct? Yes. And not just uh, the FBI, but also the CIA. Right, but your um, attempts to contact them or at least to notify them were sort of rejected? Well, they didn't seem to be uh, acted upon, but I've since learned that appearances may be misleading. Um, if you call up Joe the Plumber, the resurrect Joe the Plumber from a previous political debate a couple of years ago, that was a, a name that was being bounced off of everything. Mythical guy. But it turns out that there are lots of guys named Joe and some of them are plumbers, so there is a Joe the Plumber. But uh, my point is that uh, you call up somebody who you think is Joe the Plumber, or somebody comes to your door, says you have a package for me, and you hand him the package and goes away. He might have identified himself to you as Joe the Plumber, but who was that masked man? Now, in this subject, in this field, you sometimes don't know who you're dealing with or know who's subscribing to your work. Well, I don't know who all the people who were my subscribers on Nuncius. Well, it could very well be that one of them or two of them works for another government or for our own government. The, uh, this medieval astrology has become very interesting to certain elements of our society. Some of them are religious elements. Some of them are political elements. And some of them are I remember I had a very interesting interchange with a Pakistani fellow, Pakistani astrologer who's no slouch of his kind of astrology. And uh, I learned later that there were probably political connections between him and Pakistan. So you don't always know. And as a result, I can't say categorically that I was turned down. Nobody ever turned me down in that respect. Nobody ever expressed any doubt. But on the other hand, nobody ever expressed any enthusiasm. They didn't come in waving flags saying, I'm in the CAA. Right. Well, I just thought it would be good to point that out. Uh, I read a skeptic article sometime recently that was... Uh, a- asking the question of, of if you had made these predictions ahead of time, then why didn't you contact somebody? So I, I always thought that was interesting because you had, in fact, attempted to, to contact someone. But moving on from that, uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you uh, is if you have uh, any advice to new astrologers or to astrologers who are just getting into traditional astrology, what would be your greatest piece of advice after your last 20 or 30 years working with traditional astrology? Work, work, work. Don't spend, don't waste any time. Vita brevis. Experience the difficulties at the end of life is brief and short. And the experience is difficult to get. So don't waste your time on psychological astrology and on any other kind of astrology then. Put your time into medieval astrology, first of all. Start at the bottom. Don't assume that the people who are writing this book are fraud, because while that is true often of the modern writers, and especially as I have found out in the academic circles where you have academics involved with secret societies of various sorts, and they will criticize the only astrology that works, and they know that it works. They just don't like to see stuff about medieval astrology. So they rather write about Chiron and Black Moons and other such fantasies. And uh, the third thing is 
to expect concrete manifestations of accurate delineation and prediction. In other words, the stuff that we're dealing with is not airy fairy, it's not symbols. I don't know what word I can use in lieu of symbols, but it's certainly not symbolic. We're talking about something which is which matters somehow. When we say that something matters, we mean that it's important. But we also mean often that it is operating in some form of matter. And I think that that's the case in, in, in astrology. Like we're dealing with changes in matter. And matter on different levels. And some matter is more refined than other matters. Some matter is grosser than other matters. So there's this given ambiguity or equivocation in the word ma- matter itself. The word itself has at least two different meanings to it. And I have come to conclude at this point, I may change my opinion later, but I don't think I'm going to have to. Um, we have to know what astrology is. This is still in the third heading. And what astrology is, is, is the science, the only science at the present time, except for perhaps string theory. This science, are called astrology, by the Neoplatonists and the Hermetic philosophers, and I don't really care what the modern philosophers are. Physicists and the rest of them say astrology is a science, and it's a science in particular of how God's will becomes material and shapes this world. And it's a very complex science, but it's an extremely interesting science. And uh, I personally think that when Stephen Hawking holds his television interview with uh, this Jesuit guy, the Jesuit guy says to him, quite appropriately, says to him, I'm sorry to see you actually taking God out of your system. You didn't do that in your previous book. You left the door open as to whether or not there was a God. Now, I think that the Jesuit is absolutely right there. And that we all should, however we understand this term, God, leave the door open to the possibility that there is such a thing. Because I have a feeling that it's going to matter at some time. That raises a question I wanted to ask you, ask you in an issue, which is, what is your philosophy of astrology at this point? And is there a specific philosophical school or a religious tradition that you identify with more or or feel more sympathetic towards? I'm rather eclectic. One of my friends from this area accuses me of drawing from this and from that and trying to piece it all together in some sort of mosaic and he has doubts about whether these things actually fit together. You know, I guess I have doubts about whether they fit properly together. But my eclecticism, which is real, is right in branding me an eclectic. I am eclectic. Is nevertheless, uh, an effort of a creature, such as myself, looking at the world around me and trying to climb up to the the Phrygia Dei, the footsteps of God, to the higher reality. Now, what's a higher reality? I better not go there. That's going to take too much time. Let me say instead that, that in answer to your question, which brand of philosophy do I favor? I'm very much taken with uh, Kabbalah, very much taken with Neoplatonism, very much taken with hermeticism. Is my philosophy pure in any one of these directions? Probably not, because I'm not a sectarian kind of guy. 
And yet I did convert to Lutheranism in 1989, partially because it was my father's religion and because I knew that uh, Johann Arndt, the famous Lutheran theologian, and before him, Camerarius and uh, Melanchthon were all actively involved in astrology and alchemy and possibly even magic. Certain aspects of magic, natural magic anyway, which is uh, interesting to look at because it's very clear that natural magic is the parent of a natural science. But at any rate, you raised two or three questions there. One was, uh, which one of these philosophies do I incline most to? Well, I'm actually, at this point, I'm trying to wean myself out of astrology and go back in the direction of alchemy, because there's stuff that I passed up there years ago that I've got to reconsider. And I'm very much taken by the, uh, this isn't philosophy any longer, but it does fall under the category of practice. Practice. And the, uh, it was the Book of Enoch that really sent me in this direction. Do you know the Book of Enoch? Uh, yeah. Enoch is a wonderful book uh, describing something that is mentioned only briefly in the Bible in a number of places. For instance, John on Patmos and, uh, I'm not mistaken, Paul and prior to both of them, Elijah and uh, before all of them, before Elijah, Enoch himself, all practiced this out-of-body ecstasis, this ecstatic out-of-body experience, where they saw and had first-hand experiences of um, spiritual reality. So that's something that intrigues me now, and I've, I've been recently looking at Finnish paganism and uh, Estonian paganism and the old Germanic paganism and the Celtic tradition of dabbling in all those. It started out as a sort of diversion, but the diversion is becoming a holding my attention. So I may end up doing something with these three areas of study or practice. All the more so because uh, it's plain to me now that the astrology that we're always arguing about and practicing occasionally is a mathematical astrology heavily influenced by the Greeks. Now, that's not a, a, a criticism of the Greeks, not by far. But it does say that it is essentially a left-brained activity for them and for us. There must be a corresponding right-brained activity in astrology. And I think that that is met with in the magical field, but exactly how I'm not ready to say publicly. Speaking of that, one of the things about your philosophy I want to ask you is if you have a strong position on the issue of uh, fate and free will at this point. I know in the late 80s you wrote an article on Stoicism for the NCGR, but then you're also very involved in alchemy and in the magical traditions as well. So where do you come down on that issue of determinism? Well, I think I still got to say along the Stoics that we have a nature and that nature doesn't really change. But having said that, let me make the case a little bit more strongly. I haven't changed my opinion on the question of fate versus free will in the sense that I haven't gotten off of the fact that what is going to happen to us happens to us. And if 
little that we can do to change this. Um, however, I have seen intervention. I've seen, I, I thought I saw it back in the 80s when I was struggling with the free versus free will concept and it was coming down on the side of determinism. But now I have seen so many ex uh, examples of intervention, which I, in a sense, I've got something to measure it against now in astrology. In astrology, I can say, this is what's going to happen. And the magician, or whatever you want to call the feminine version of the magician, maybe magician, I don't know, witch, maybe, a necromancer, that's a nice word, I like that word. They, that person walks onto the scene and begins to change things for people. So, I can't help but conclude at the moment, and this is, I'm very uncomfortable with this, because this is not, with reason you like to, even when you don't agree with the conclusions, you like the conclusions to be clear, unassailable, plain as the nose on your face, and unambiguous. But we don't get that in life, it seems. And as a result, what I have seen and what I can attest to is that change can be brought about if you know what to do and how to do it and do it long enough. And that might sound like a bit of a cop out if you think about it, because it might sound as though to do it long enough might be, might be years. But I'm not really talking about years, things that take years to do. It might take a couple of weeks. At the outside, it might take one week. Um, sometimes they don't take much time at all. And change does happen. And it's, it's clear to me that this change would not have happened if it weren't for the interve intervention of this person with a special ability. Am I answering your question? Yeah, I think that that's a good answer. Um, or, or that I think that'll be sufficient. One of the last things I want to ask you is, do you have any uh, advice or insights into any techniques or technical doctrines that you feel have been really useful to you, but that you feel that not a lot of people know about at this point? Yeah. Now, this is a funny question, because this is, uh, in one sense, getting right to the core of the issue. Uh, teaching, what you teach people, what the context is in which the teaching takes place. Well, one of the things I can say safely is that uh, the dispositor has a twofold relationship to the planet or sign disposed by it. And this has helped me a lot in my delineation. I think that uh, I ran across this rule that I'm about to recite. First in Maureen, Jean Baptiste Maureen, and the boss. And then I have worked with that for years and years and years. I simply cannot give it up without losing a lot of accuracy and insight into what I'm dealing with. So the sign, let's take a sign. Aries, for instance. Aries is ruled by Mars. I can see, by virtue of the rule, the good or bad signified by a house, emanates from the ruler of the house. I can see that uh, this, actually I'm thinking about a specific thing, so I'm going to get that out of my mind. Because I've got, I don't need more than one specific case here. A little bit of mental discipline is going to have to be good here. What a bad thing if I buy a house emanating from the ruler of the house. First of all, is the house that Mars is in a good house or a bad house? First question. Let's assume it's in the 11th house. Let's assume that it rules the second house. That Aries is on the second house cut. No, I, I want automatically to know 
what to expect with that configuration. And since Mars is, uh, Mars is sign, Aries is on the second house cusp, which is a questionable sort of a mixed house, not really bad, certainly not really good. The malefic nature of Mars does tend to make you think that the person who has got this configuration is willing to do just about anything to make a buck. And they're not going to let any opposition of any sort get in their way. At the same time, so what you've got in that case is you've got Mars, the planet ruling the second house, is the source of the money. The money made is coming from that Mars. And Mars is going to show us how the money is made, how much money is made, all the rest of that sort of stuff. So it's the source of the, the ruler of the house is the source of the house. At the same time, the ruler of the house is also the outlet for the house. Because if that Mars were in the fifth house, it could very well be that your children get your money. Because the energy of the, it's like an electrical circuit between the sign and the ruler of the sign. So that's the second way the uh, rulership works. And the good or bad signified by a house emanates from the ruler of the house will often explain a great deal. Now, I just had a good friend over here. She had Aries on the ninth house. And she had Mercury in the ninth in Aries. It's actually in the eighth. And it's actually in, it's in the ninth house, like quadrant houses. Ninth house and quadrant houses. Taurus would be the ninth house, and that goes a little bit to the left, by whole sign houses. Now, if we look at this from the point of view of whole sign houses, that Venus in the seventh house, which is exalted in the seventh house, promises a lovely partnership. She hasn't had very lovely partnerships because her Mercury, the ruler of her ascendant in Aries, in the ninth house by quadrant houses, is square to Jupiter, ruler of the seventh house. Well, the ruler of the first and ruler of the seventh in inimical relationship to each other by the square makes for hostility there. But if you want to get into, and she has had plenty of hostility in her relationship, notwithstanding that Venus, which I think is going to eventually pay off and help her a great deal, but you've got to keep her buoyed up in order for that blessed day to come by. You get my where, where I'm going with that? Yeah, um, I think that makes a lot of sense. That's definitely a, a core rule, uh, and I'm letting you apply to, that. If I want to go further, I can say about that Mercury, that Mercury in Aries makes a debater, somebody who is very good at debating legal issues in particular. And in the old days, in the middle, middle ages, they would say, canon law? as well as secular law. Now, she's sharp as a tack, but she's got problems with her relationship. But that Mercury in Aries is disposed by Mars. And Mars is causing that debate. So if you can do that, and you can link in the house meetings to the, to the planet's positions in the signs, you've got, you've got detail, which is very admirable. Well, let's, I guess we'll go ahead and wrap this up. Uh, what are you working on now and where can people find out more about your work? Well, they can, uh, go to www.virginastrology.com at the moment. And, uh, hopefully for a long time hence. And what I'm working on at the moment is, uh, just that I alluded to before, 
talking about this non-mathematical astrology. I'm very interested in the spiritual aspect of astrology, and perhaps even in the religious aspect of astrology. So I'll leave it at that. Okay. Well, great. Well, everyone, uh, please check out his website at uh, virginastrology.com. And um, Robert, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you for having me, Chris. It's always a pleasure talking to you, and I hope that everybody enjoys what was edified. But most importantly, that they enjoyed what I was talking about. Well, that's it for tonight's show. Thanks for listening to Traditional Astrology Radio, and I will see you next time. Thanks to the patrons who helped to support the production of this episode of the Astrology Podcast through our page on Patreon.com. In particular, shout out to patrons Christine Stone, Nate Craddock, and Marin Altman, as well as the Astrogold Astrology app available at astrogold.io, the Portland School of Astrology at portlandastrology.org, and the Honeycomb Collective Personal Astrological Almanacs available at honeycomb.co. The production of this episode of the podcast is also supported by the International Society for Astrological Research, which is hosting a major astrology conference in Denver, Colorado, September 10th through the 14th, 2020. More information about that at isar2020.org. And finally, also Solar Fire Astrology Software, which is available at alabe.com, and you can use the promo code AP15 for a 15% discount on that software. For more information about how to become a patron of the Astrology Podcast and help support the production of future episodes while getting access to subscriber benefits like early access to new episodes or other bonus content, go to patreon.com slash astrologypodcast.